everybody. Thank you for sacrificing what looks like the beginning of uh, spring to be here with us today. So it's my great pleasure to um, to welcome Monique Mojica to Brown University, which I don't think you've ever been here, no, right? Um, and, and to Providence. So um, I have a brief bio for her, but the, the personal part of the story is that um, I was introduced to Monique's work um, by my mentor and now very close friend, Tamara Underreiner, who does work on theater in Chiapas, and she taught this amazing post-colonial theater class when I was a first-year graduate student, and that's how I was introduced to, to Monique's work, and now I teach it fairly regularly, as is Lily this semester, so I know that a lot of you have been taking class with Lily and have read Monique's work. Um, so I'm gonna read her bio, which is super fabulous, and just forgive me for reading, but I've had about five hours of sleep, so me embellishing and telling funny stories and being super entertaining about a bio is not gonna happen today, but it's not from lack of enthusiasm, it's only from lack of sleep. Um, so Monique is um, of the Kuna and Rappahannock Nation. She's an actor and a playwright, passionately uh, dedicated to theatrical practice as an act of healing and of reclaiming historical and cultural memory and of resistance, and you'll see how that work um, happens today. Spun directly from the family web of New York's Spider Woman Theater, which a lot of you probably also know of Spider Woman Theater. Her theatrical practice embraces not only her artistic lineage through mining stories embedded in the body, but also the connections to stories coming through land and place. So Monique's first play, Princess Pocahontas in the Blue Spots, was produced in 1990 and is taught in curricula internationally. She's the co-founder of the Turtle Gals Performance Ensemble, with which she created the Scrubbing Project. Um, the Dora nominated The Triple Truth and The Only Good Indian, and in 2007, she founded Chocolate Woman Collective to develop the Chocolate Woman Dreams of Milky Way, a performance created by devising a dramaturgy specific to Kuna cultural aesthetics, story narrative, and literary structure, and hopefully today she'll talk about those, those development processes, which are actually quite, quite long. Um, so Monique has taught indigenous theater in theory, process, and practice at the University of Illinois the uh, Institute for American Indian Arts, McMaster University, and is the former co-director of the Center for Indigenous Theater. And she's lectured on embodied research and taught embodied performance workshops throughout Canada, the US, Latin America, and Europe. Um, upcoming projects, one of which I believe she's talking about today, include Sideshow Freaks and Circus Engines, co-written with Choctaw playwright Leanne Howe, and directed by Jorge Luis Marijón, um, and who has some Cuban roots here, glad to know. <laughs> um, this work in progress includes an illustrious collaborative team of indigenous artists from diverse disciplines. And in April 2016, which is very soon upon us, she will appear as a dancer in the world premiere of Kawahi. Am I saying that right? Kahawi. Kahawi. <laughs> Dance Theater's Requickening, conceived and choreographed by Mohawk artist Santi Smith. You might have also seen her in a number of films. I don't know if she's talking about that today. Um, but without further ado, I just want to introduce Monique and open the floor to her. So thank you for being here. Moedi, Anuga Olo Nadili, Olo Edidili, Ganosok Ta. I was born Puna Rapahana and adopted into the Cayuga Bear Clan of the Haudenosaunee. And the first thing I want to do today is acknowledge the keepers, the caretakers, the stewards of the land that we are on, the Narragansett Nation of New England, and acknowledge and thank them as being part as many of us on, on the East Coast were of catching that first wave of the invasion, the first wave of colonization. So still here, still here, still here, still here, still here, still here, still here. Still here. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the extended uh, embodied research that is ongoing right now uh, for Sideshow Freaks and Circus Engines. Across the 13 moons on Turtle's Back, across multiples of centuries, the mother mounds are calling to their children, come home. They call, sing, Coo, echo, 
Um, they infiltrate our sleeping and our waking dreams with whispers of thought they make as if our very own clone. It's time. Come home to rest your hearts in the layered folds of mother's skirts. They send out a call. We, who think these thoughts as if they were our very own, search for the source of the song, the mother voice, and then gently lay down each bony vertebra of our spines, one by one, on the ancient textured soil. Then, vibrating, we align our frequencies to the constellations and join a dialogue begun long ago, mirrored from the upper world onto nodes and nerve centers on turtles' back, creating the world between through earthworks imagined, crafted, and mounded basket by 50-pound basket by minds, hands, thighs, and muscled backs through earth itself. We are in conversation. This is real. So the beginnings of this work started uh, in the parking lot of the American Indian Studies at the University of Illinois. Uh, Leanne Howe had invited me there to uh, teach for, for a semester, and we were sitting huddled in her car, and we discovered that something that we shared with each other was family history, where either in her case, her great aunt Yuda had run off and joined the circus and had an Indian act on horseback. She ran off from Stonewall, Oklahoma uh, to where the circus camped and outside of Ada at a place called Dag's Prairie. And my family, my mother, performed the sideshow at a place called Golden City Amusement Park, which was a competitor to Coney Island. You know it? You know you've heard of that place? We should talk, because I've been, not been able to find very much about it other than the family story. It was in Canarsie, Brooklyn. It burnt down in 1939. And in fact, I, until I started this work, I didn't know its official name, because the family just referred to it as the Canarsie Carnival. And my mother had told me these stories about being in the sideshow, and that there was the big top, you know, where the circus acts were, and outside the big top there was the sideshow where you had um, people with physical anomalies and the sword swallowers and the uh, bearded lady and the fire breathers, and then you had the Indian village underneath the roller coaster where my mother, as a six-year-old, had some very deep scars laid into her. And Leanne and I started to talk about this. And Leanne <coughs> said to me, I want to dislodge this colonialism from my body. For me, I want to dislodge that gaze on me, which has gone through generations. I had to ask, what, what am I carrying? you know, from my mother as a six-year-old. I ask her, what do you very much you remember? She says, I remember sitting outside the teepee at a picnic table eating spaghetti while people watched and pointed and laughed. And I do have to say that that phenomenon has not gone very far you know, in North American society. I, I, we are still the, our bodies themselves are the entertainment and titillation as the other. I can't tell you how many times I grab my braid out of people's hands because it is touch, to touch me, touch my person, 
is something that uh, a lot of folks just feel we were entitled to. So that's where we started. A lot of the work that I've done has been about devising dramaturgies that are not based on Eurocentric structures, not based on beginning, middle, climax, end, not based on the one, two, three acts, repeat something three times, that, that trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, which really has nothing to do with how we tell stories on this land. Uh, my previous work, uh, Princess Pocahontas was, I didn't know it, but only in retrospect preparing the, the, the manuscript did I realize that it was built on a medicine wheel. 13, 13 movements, 13 moons, four directions. The scrubbing project is a healing ceremony. Uh, Chocolate Woman Dreams the Milky Way was based on the structures in Kuno women's textile, the molas, which are our clothing, and on pictographs that uh, notate what the medicine chants are, healing chants. And Leanne and the other thing Leanne and I share from, from the other side of my family's bloodline are the, the Rappahannock, who are Powhatan people down the coast here by Virginia, once it turned, goes, stops being Iroquoian and goes Algonquin again. And Leanne is Choctaw, so one of the things that we shared was also coming from people who were mound builders, that southeastern, that, that southern Indian thing. And being a native person in the south is to be more invisible than one ever might imagine. So one of the things that we decided to try to investigate through the uh, impetus that came from another southeastern artist, uh, Chadwick Allen, who's a literary guy. Uh, he wrote a book some of you may know of, uh, Trans Indigenous is Literary Stuff. He was very um, instrumental in the early days from some of his writing that talked about effigy mounds and earthworks being the first literature of this land. And it is not only the, are they legible, written on the land, but through the medium of earth. So we went to look at mounds and to decode and discover what we could use of that literary structure and what we could transpose for performance and script writing purposes. So that's what I'm going to talk about a little bit today, as some of that, that journey. Are you with me so far? Yes. yes. OK, good. This is Serpent Mound. This is the Great Serpent Mound in Ohio. Can you see it? Do we need to close, the, do we need to close this? You think? Lights out, yeah. Because I'm, I'm seeing that it's kind of hard to see how. There. This is the Great Serpent Mound. Great Serpent Mound was built uh, where there was already a phenomenon, that there was an ancient meteor strike there. As you can see, this, this map, oh, I've got, I don't have to walk over there. I've got this handy thing, right? Let's yeah, see yeah, if I can there. be high tech. Ah! <laughs> No, it went away. Oh. Help. You have to stay it. on. Oh, I have to hold it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So from way up here, right on, a lot of them follow the Mississippi River right into the Gulf of Mexico. And what isn't on this map, and I actually just spent the month of February in Florida visiting mounds here, and you'll see some of those, but it actually goes right on down into like, the Gulf of Mexico and on into Cuba. One of, the, one of the things that's really, really fascinating to me is that there are mounds here around Toronto, where I live, the Thunderbird Mound, Tabor Hill, Bear Mound, and the Serpent Mound, which is around Hiawatha First Nations. <coughs> and when we went on to this 
sight that you can see we were aware. And the uh, oral history is still there. The elder that brought us onto that site told us this, the, the technology for building these mounds came from the Shawnee, came from the South, or, the, or their ancestors. This is Serpent Mound that you saw in that first image in the Ohio Valley. This is a direct alignment. So when I'm talking about alignments, that's just one. All of these there are crisscrosses of alignments, and they're aligned with the stars, they're aligned with each other. You can walk from a mound complex to mound complex if you know how to navigate the stars. If you are walking from what, what is referred to as the Great Hopewell Road, of which there are remnants of the berms that lined the side of what, it's a highway now, but that between Chillicothe, Ohio, where Mound City is, up to Newark, Ohio, around, which is outside of Columbus, you're walking under the Milky Way. And that again is showing some of the trade and how we're all connected. How we were all connected, which to me is one of the things that this whole colonial project tried to break is the is the pre-contact interaction and interconnectedness of the peoples and of the hemisphere. They like to put us within their geopolitical borders, which I'm finding more and more was just so not so. This is Leanne, where we started the first the first visit we we did. The yeah, other was um, near. Guelph, Ontario, a place called St. Thomas in Southwold Earthworks, so there's a double ring. Signage is real important in a lot of this work. This is in the middle of St. Paul, Minnesota. There are six mounds in a park. This is where I made the, uh, <laughs> I, don't know, I was about to say mistake, but experiment. There are two mounds on this side, there's a little pathway, and then there are two like about where I'm standing in relation to that. I stood between them. <laughs> it was like, you know, taking a, a tuning fork and sticking it in the ground, and I was just going like that. It was, uh, it's quite, they're very, very strong. They are deliberately engineered, architectured, through astronomy and physics to be that way. Yeah? These ones are burial mounds. There's a lot of the, the dome-shaped ones are, the conical ones. Signage. In some places where we went, especially around the, like Toronto High Park, 57 mounds, none of them marked. Now, 57 mounds. So we were walking around trying to find one, it's like, Okay, feels like maybe over here. What do you think? You know, but, uh, some of the signage is problematic. The words that jump out of you are prehistoric, decline, disappear, words like that, demise. So I'm glad to see ones like this. I met up with Leanne after that, going through uh, Minnesota and Iowa in Cahokia, which is right outside of present day St. Louis, Missouri. This was a huge area where there were many, many, many mounds. In fact, two years ago, in 2014, city of, of St. Louis destroyed 100 mounds. There were 100 mounds that were there. That was the last destruction. In order to build the site of the 1904 World's Fair, which is the main um, setting, even though we, we go through times and places, now, but the main setting for the characters in our play, Sideshow Freaks and Circus Engines, is that they are performing at the 1904 World's Fair. In order to build that grounds where they created these gesso, plaster of Paris, cotton candy buildings that represented civilization, they destroyed 16 mounds. That site 
is 19 minutes away from Ferguson. So it kind of makes you wonder, it could take 100 years, but actions have consequences. Cahokia has a very different uh, personality. Each one of these sites have their own sort of uh, vibe, their own personality. Cahokia is very sort of martial. One of the things that we started to realize is that there are feelings of them that I think that they're gendered. And this one is really particularly very masculine, very martial, very show-offy. It, um, it looks like Teotihuacan, except not in stone, in earth. And you see those little tiny people there? And this is after hundreds and hundreds of years of erosion. Cahokia is also significant because it's, uh, in our oral histories, it's a place of immersion for three of the main, uh, three of the larger groups of, of indigenous peoples, the, the Iroquoian, the Algonquian, and the um, Muscogians. And uh, I had the privilege to know Chief Leon Shenandoah, who was the Taradaho of uh, the Haudenosaunee during much of my lifetime. And I remember being in 1990 at Onondaga, outside of Syracuse, and uh, him telling me, oh, I gotta go over to St. Louis. Uh, they found some bones, and they need to rebury these bones, and I'm going over there. And I said, well, Leon, you're, you're Haudenosaunee. Why are you going way over to St. Louis to do this? Why'd they ask you? He said, oh, that's, that's where we started. That's where we emerged. So in 1990, the people still had that direct knowledge, and we have it now, but there was still something that I was told as recently as, maybe it doesn't sound like it, because that's not, it's 1990s a long time ago now, right? <laughs> yeah, it is, hey? It's just some of your lifetimes. Recent enough, we still know where we come from, the way that the elder in Hiawatha First Nations knew that the technology for building mounds that are thousands of years old came from the Shawnee. So those migrations, what is this work has made me really aware of those migrations and the connections and the interconnections that are not defined by um, colonial language. Also Kokia. This is from the top now of the mound that you saw, the monks mound toward across the plaza to the other temple mount. This is a poverty point in Louisiana. This mound is different. This mound is a shape of a bird. So that's part, that's part of the, the back. There's a tail this way. She's like this, wings out like that. This was built in three months. It was over 100 feet high. They know from, how, from analyzing the soil that it went up in three months, as opposed to some of the other ones, as particularly the burial mounds that took hundreds and hundreds of years of different uh, burials and, and that kind of layering. Can you imagine the social organization that it took to build something like that in three months that's still standing. It's also at Poverty Point that became, we became aware of the soils and how they are layered inside a mound. There are different textures, there are different colors, there are different mineral compounds. Some of them, not this one, but some of them in, in uh, the Hopewell area of Ohio would be covered with a layer of clay and then a layer of ochre. So they had a different, more sort of crust, uh, more kind of permanent look on the outside. 
Our adventure about finding this mound was, is really, uh, this is a real sidebar. It's one of those, those odd conversations, but also speaks to our invisibility. And that's part of the, 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 large, the larger tension in this work that we're doing is between our, our invisibility as indigenous people on the landscape and how that is reflected by, and we are, ref or I don't know if we reflect them or they reflect us, their invisibility, the mound's invisibility on the landscape, and, let, and at the same time, they're huge and undeniable. And what we are aware of is that as long as we are playing Indian within a narrative that supports uh, invasion, colonization, and white superiority, we're good. As long as we play Indian, we are hyper visible. No, I'm not always so good, because you're also hyper-visible as a freak, and, or in the Hollywood kind of freak shows. If we are standing on our own terms, knowing who we are, we are invisible. And so with the mounds. They also, I believe, that the ancestors endowed them with the ability to cloak themselves, to be veiled. Because you can, as we were trying to find these ones, set out with your GPS and your Google Maps and know exactly where you're going and be going to some place where you've been before. But if you're not ready to find the mounds that day, they won't let you find them. You'll go around, they'll get you good and lost, they'll get you totally exhausted and ready to give up. And then you'll come around the corner, same corner, and they'll be <gasps> right there. And that's happened enough times, not only on this line, uh, land, but a friend of mine went looking for mounds, at, he's half German. He went looking for mounds in Germany, because they're also in Germany, they're in Denmark, they're in Poland, they're in Bretagne, they're in Dorset, England. When he went looking in, in uh, Germany, same thing. Couldn't find them, couldn't find them, couldn't find them. And then all of a sudden, there they were. When we went looking for this one, we arrived in Delhi, Louisiana, two Native women traveling alone in the Deep South. And we arrived in the evening, and we were following this map that just took us farther and farther and farther out into the boondocks. Finally, you know, Leanne says, I smell water. We can't possibly be going in the right way. We turn around, we, tr use the, we, we try and use the phone. There was hardly any battery left. We found out that there was that where we were looking for, we were looking for the hotel actually that we were staying, that they, it didn't exist. It was very twilight zone. And we got very, very lost in a spooky way. The next day, when we went to the Poverty Point site and went into their interpretive center, the first thing I saw was this map. It was a triangular map of Epps, Delhi, Lake Providence, and Floyd. What that map was showing was the area where Jesse James and, uh, oh, I just lost the other partner's name, Jesse James, Frank and Jesse James, and <laughs> they'll come back to me where they buried their treasure from their last big heist in Mexico. And for 150 years, people have been digging up around there. They went to that area because they had relatives there. Well, I didn't know, those, those fellows were Chickasaws. <laughs> Frank and Jesse James went to school with Linda Hogan's grandfather at the, the uh, Harley School for Indian Boys. But that, triangle was exactly where we had been lost. And there are all kinds of stories of people digging up around the mound trying to find that loot. And also stories that there was a secret entrance and tunnel behind the mound that went down in the woods, came up the other side in a cabin that nobody ever saw them enter or leave. So there's all kinds of... Uh, odd interconnections there. But if they don't want you to find them, you're not gonna. This place gave us songs. 
Oops, I went the wrong way. That's Leanne. Some of you may know her work, um, Shell Shaker, Miko Kings. If you don't know her work, find her work. She's an important writer. This was on my third attempt to find the burial mounds, the Rappahannock burial mounds in Virginia. We kept go out, going back and trying to find them. No one could help us. We, it was really, it was one of those lost causes again. We went there this day with a Rappahannock elder named Susie Fortune. She kept saying, I remember that they were down by the road. You could see them from the road. They were by these trees. I remember seeing them. They were tromping through the grass. And there was this buzzard. And they kept flying around and swooping down the hill. And they and swooped down the hill. They said, OK, all right, all right, all right. Where, where, where are you trying to take me? I followed him down that hill. And that's when we found them. This place is now a vineyard and a dilapidated, fallen into disrepair, talk about demise, uh, campground. And you cannot really see it very clearly, but where that sign in is, is one mound, and then there are two more that you can barely kind of see the imprint as you go down that field that's been plowed. And there they are. That's uh, out. On the, uh, there's a point out in this land, uh, comes out on, on a point called Cat Point Creek, which is a site of, uh, of a Rappahannock village. And there, this is, we are now across, across the river from the site in the, other, in the other slide, in Cat Point Creek. So the stories that we're telling, a necessary part is connecting to family, to people, to belonging, to nationhood, to the land. And there I am, feet in the creek. This is on the Pamunkey Reservation, which is one of the two oldest reservations in the US. The other one is Mattapanai. And that <coughs> is a, a burial mound that uh, the story goes that, that Powhatan is buried there. Powhatan was Pocahontas' father. But they also tell me they feel that, the, that there are many more that go back in the bush here. It's one that's, uh, there's railroad tracks that goes right through that mound. They're bisected. And many of them have had that kind of destruction and been profaned. like the Octagon Earthworks in Newark, Ohio, which has become the Mound Builders Golf Course and Country Club. That's a tough one. You can't access it except for certain days of the year. I think there's one day. The first time I went there, we got a special dispensation because there was a uh, uh, conference at Ohio State University of many Native scholars and uh, we were taken, we had, we had to be there at 7 o'clock in the morning because we had to be off by the time that the golfers were coming on. So we had these all, these quite important and illustrious group of Native scholars all trying to do our ceremony real quick. I mean it was Phil Deloria and Joy Harjo and you know all these people that are the heavy hitters and uh, Robert Warrior, folks like that. They sang our songs for this place. This is still the Octagon Earthworks. The place called Site Mound, that's a burial mound. This is all along the uh, Great Hopewell Road in Ohio. And that's doing some embodied work, site-specific. Mound City in Chillicothe was uh, turned into Camp Sherman during World War I. It's where the Sherman tanks were built. So a lot of the destructions there at, uh, at Mound City were done during that time. They built the barracks. They dug up all kinds of stuff. It's protected now. 
but it's one of the one of the ways in which these sacred sites were profaned. Sherman tanks. Those are burial mounds, by the way. That's the Great Circle at Newark. Again, that's right in the center. You can see some of the other mounds uh, in the other parts of the circle in front of me there. That, at one point, became an amusement park and a racetrack and Buffalo Bills Congress of Rough Riders and Wild West Show performed there. <coughs> this is Great Serpent Mound again. That's part of the team at uh, Tabor Hill. It's outside of Toronto. There's about 500 people in that mound, surrounded by a split level residential area. Again, one of those places that unless you know it's there, even with that little bit of signage, you go right by it. What I love about these two pictures is that we did not discuss, any of us, what we would do when we arrived at this site. It kind of always happens simultaneously. We had tobacco, and everyone went to ground. Everyone approached, everyone went to ground. The site was littered with soccer balls. And that's Michael Gray Eyes over here, who was directing at one point, and uh, that's the end. He went about kicking the soccer balls <laughs> off the mound. This is uh, Hiawatha First Nations, that's Rice Lake. This is the one that's directly aligned with Serpent Mound in Ohio. <laughs> I like that one because it looks like I fell out of the sky. <laughs> In every one of these places, except for one, we were led to where we needed to go by beings of transformation. Butterflies, dragonflies, damselflies, bats, frogs, snakes, buzzard, blue heron. an albino squirrel. I followed a blue damselfly to this spot on the mound, and I lay myself down. I lay there for a while, and when I got up, the elder, Doug Williams, who brought us to the site, he's an Anishinaabe, he was standing there, he looked at me, he goes, you yeah, felt that, did ya? And I think, yeah, yes. Well, there's a lot of them there, right there, right where you were. There's a lot of them in there, right there. There used to be a sheet of plexiglass there. And they had dug a hole down into the mountain. You could see all the bones. You could see all those ancestors. You could see in this hole the bones all on top of each other. And uh, we made them take that away. We made them cover that up. So from that... I, I wrote a piece which may or may not end up in the final production, which talks about the voices on the inside of the mound talking to us, saying, oh, so it's an inside outside kind of piece. But I've learned to trust those beings that uh, tell me where to go. I would never have found those those mounds down by the road if I hadn't paid attention to that buzzer. This is in Ohio, again, a place that they call it alligator mound. It's not an alligator. It's more like a, a, it's some sort of feline. But this one was significant in that we saw her breathing. We stood there, it was right before dusk, and you could you could see the earth. You could feel the respiration from that. 
from that being. Ha! Well, this was the time we decided we'd be real smart. And since the, the Newark and Octagon Earthworks, for a long time, they thought, oh, well, there's no alignments here. Many of them, like the, like the pyramids and other places, are aligned. They have solar alignments, and it has to do with the, the equinox and the solstice and all of that. The Serpent Mound also is one of those that has uh, solar alignments. And uh, the people that study these things, they said, oh, well, no alignments at, at the Octagon or the Newark. Uh, then they check the lunar alignments, and it, they it's a place that is built to coincide to lunar alignments. And it's, it means it's a, it's a nighttime place. So we thought we would be real wise. We're going to go there at night. This is us. <laughs> at night, at the earthworks. And you can see all those orbs around us. It was not raining. And we noticed that all the trees were kind of tilting this one way. And that if I stood on that same place where you saw from the other photograph, I was like this. I was standing there at night. I could lean way out like that, you know, Michael Jackson trick where you're like this. And I was held up, you know, by this energy. And um, there were many beings of transformation there, too. There were. We could hear the insects and the peepers and bats. And there's, uh, we have this recorded, actually. There were, there's Leanne's voice counting bats. One, two, there. she'd get to eight, and then she'd start again. One, <laughs> two, there were just all these bats coming around us. We then went our separate ways. What we didn't know is that none of us slept for 36 hours after that. We were too charged. It had overcharged our batteries to the point that no sleep was happening. So, it was a good experiment, but you have to be careful because of the power. Now, we didn't hurt ourselves, but we were really <laughs> exhausted. This is Alabama. This is Moundville, Alabama. This was a, a place that we really felt had a different gendered feeling of being very, very different from Cahokia in its feeling of embrace and nurturing. Felt very feminine. This is actually where we'd like to do the premiere of the piece, Moundville. It's, um, outside of Tuscaloosa. It means Black Warrior. This is Naniwaya. Naniwaya is the mother mound of the Choctaw. This is one of the ones we couldn't find. It didn't matter how many times Leanne had been there. This is her mother mound, and we couldn't find it found it right before dusk, right when it started to rain. Grand village of the Natchez. And this is Emerald, Emerald Mound. This mound is eight acres, eight, eight, or eight, eight acres, yeah. There's a mound like this on either end in this large expanse. This this, oops, sorry. This are our shadows at the top of that mound. So that's how tiny we are in that expanse. This is Dorset, England. This is a place called My Dun, which means Big Hill. And I'm really uh, conscious that we can't take our Western Hemisphere sensibility of what the mounds are 
and impose it on the ones in Europe. They're even much, much farther away from the connection with these. But I have big questions about what it means that peoples in very disparate parts of the world at roughly the same time period were building these earthen structures and that they were important. This one, down this side, has like a labyrinth so that you would have to know the way through the labyrinth to get up there and it was a protection from, from enemies, from attack. This is all terrace. I'm interested in going to more in Europe because I have a big question. I have a big question about, I know what it has done to me to connect myself as an indigenous woman to these effigy mounds and earthworks. And I have big questions. About how would it resonate in people with European ancestry to be able to connect themselves through the earth? to where their ancestors began. Because we know how cut off people of European descent are here and world over. That was deliberately done. They killed off, they, they burned their, all, all their wise people when the church took over. So these are still there though. These are still there. They're still on the land in many places in Europe. And I, I'd like to go on those sites with, uh, with some European artists and see what happens. I don't know if it would work. I don't know if we can bridge that. I don't know if I can translate what we do here to people who are more removed. Because you know, we, we understand what our interruption is to, to that indigenous knowledge here. I'm not sure that it's understood in the same way in Europe. Yeah? My done. Again, same place. And this is a place called Badbury Rings, also in Dorset. And towards the outside, away from those rings where there was a village, we saw these three conical mounds. This is why one of the things that I say, being careful of interpretation. For us here, if there were three mounds away from the rest of the, the, the complex, those would be the burial mounds. That would have been our guests, you know, Leanne and I. Don't know if that's so with these ones aware of being careful of that interpretation. Oh boy, everybody looks like they're related to the Hulk in this one. This is Trinidad. This is a, a mound called Banwari Trace. It's a burial mound. It's the oldest archaeological site in the Caribbean. This is October 2014. <coughs> with Santi Smith and her daughter, Samaya. And this is Jorge Luis Morejon, who has recently come on as the director of this project, of Sideshow Freaks and Circus Engines. And we'll, I'll be showing you some of the work that I've just begun to do with him. And this man, his name is Hamlet. Hamlet Harry Persad took over from his father as, as caretaker of this site. It is in line with the sacred mountain. This is site now. So one of the things that we did, like those, you might say, oh, well, that was a nice journey. You just saw my, my travel slides. Mm -hmm. But what did, we, what did we take away from that? What did we, what did we do with that? And, what we were able so far to identify are four principles that we can apply to performance, to creation and performance, that come from mound building principles. And those are 
duration, alignment and frequency, convergence, and integration. These are just some artist renditions that we are looking at possibilities for. These are renderings of what the cosmos and worldview is in the, the mound builder world, the upper world, the middle world, and the underworld, and the way that the, that time also sort of spirals and collapses to be all at the same time, past, present, and future in the same moment. Another thing that um, you know, talking about principles and intent. An important moment for me was in Leanne's kitchen in Ada, Oklahoma, talking to her and her husband, Jim Wilson, who was uh, formerly an archaeologist in uh, the Middle East. He and I, and Leanne put words to this, that our intent for this work is not so much that we are going to build a mound, literally. We are mounding up our stories, and the way that we are building performance from those stories is through reactivating and reanimating the original purpose of mound complex and earthworks. And not being an academic, I asked them, okay, so what's the difference of reanimating and reacting? What reactivating has to do with movement and reanimating has to do with spirit. So our intent for this work is to move the spirit. And this is Alabama again. This is kind of hard to see in this particular situation, but this, this eye in the hand image has also become an emblem, which is our, our initiating gesture for the work here. And a lot of doubling of that in, in many of the the ceramics there, there's, there's always, there's two hands. The hands will be like this or like that or like, like that. Eye in the hand, that's Orion's belt. That's a portal. Huh? That's a, the, the eye, that's the belt of Orion. Again, alignment and frequency. Conversation of, between the upper, middle, and underworld. Conversation within the mounds itself, conversation on dialogue among the mounds and where does the human standing in alignment and convergence, the responsibility with all of those energies converging, how do we integrate that to reactivate and reanimate? Again, some of the inspirations taken from mounds that, that uh, we're using towards set design, looking at something that would take something like this and be able to flip it to something like that. Oop. Also looking at things being from that, from that time period, very sort of like uh, creating our own engine steampunk. And the collision, there was, there was also a really, uh, Famously, a this is just stylistic stuff. Ah, there was a a train wreck on the way to the 1904 World's Fair, and we are also using the the collision of those two locomotives as a metaphor for the collision of worlds, and that our two characters, my main character is Izzy the Invisible Woman, as she goes into her sideshow act, and. Uh, Leanne has created a character called Panther Girl based on underwater panther. Underwater panther from Mound Builders is a very, very important creature. And 
uh, Izzy as an invisible woman is related to a, a personage, a deity who has three names. She is either called Old Woman Who Never Dies, uh, Endless Woman, and Cloud Woman, and she is the mother of Corn Woman. It's an aspect of Izzy. This is my family. That's my mom and my Aunt Elizabeth. They grew up to be Spider-Woman Theater. This is my grandma and my Aunt Lizzie. And I'm not sure who that is. This is my family in the sideshow. This is my family in the sideshow. Look how happy my mother looks. That happy little girl. <laughs> and my grandmother. My grandpa, as a Kuna man, never, ever, ever, ever would have worn that headdress. That's the marker. That's the identifier. If you wanted to be someone to recognize you, take you seriously as an Indian, you had to have that on. This is in Brooklyn. This one might be in Cedar Beach. Yeah. That's a postcard. That's my grandpa. And he always wore, in addition to this plain headdress, as a loincloth, he always wore molas. He always wore the Kuna textile somewhere on his person. There they are. That's my mama. So being generation three, that's from the uh, Golden City Amusement Park in uh, Canarsie. Again, my grandfather, this, this uh, is Stella May and Carly, who became Stella May fun maker. She was my mother's best friend from the time she was nine years old. This is her father, Sam Carley. These two, oh, that's her brother. And these two were Mohawk brothers. As you can just barely see over here where it says Golden City. Yeah. These are some designer sketches for the beginnings of costume for Izzy and Panther Girl. Some of our team, uh, as I was explaining to some of the people here in, in uh, Indigenous theater, we are designer poor. So we have a couple of costume designers. And there's a lighting designer, lighting sound designer and costume designer that's part of the collective of artists that I've that I'm working with, uh, Erica Eiserhoff, I've worked with since 2002. Michelle Charbonneau did sound and lighting for uh, Chocolate Woman Dreams the Milky Way. But we don't really have any set designers. So what I've done in, in, from far back <laughs> uh, is pull in visual artists and try to give them the support and bridge to scenic design. So these two. Um, Southeastern fellas. This is Dustin Major, who's Chickasaw, and Marcus Ammerman, who's Choctaw, and they have agreed to take a chance in moving over into set design. <coughs> hey, yeah. Uh, hello. Excuse me. I have to greet these people. Hello. I don't know who to hug first. <laughs> Good to see you. Good to see you. Hello. Thank you. Thank you for coming here. Thank you for coming here. I, I have to introduce these are local uh, Narragansett folks, the, the people that I acknowledge here at the, at the beginning. This is uh, Tolo, his niece Dawn Spears, and her husband Cassius. Yes. yes. So thank you for being here and thank you for holding it down on the East Coast. <laughs> still here, still here, still here, still here. Thank you for coming. Oops. 
and this, uh, this was from a workshop that was done in 2013. People come in and out of uh, uh, workshops, and by the time we get to production, people come and go with this. During this workshop performance, Michael Greyeyes was our director. He is not with the, with the project any longer. Jorge has stepped into that role as director. This is Michelle Charbonneau, Set and Lights. This is Jared Tate, who's the composer. He's, so we've got Mohawk Anishinaabe, Chickasaw Cree, Chickasaw Choctaw. One of the things that Leanne and I did is we went and did training in Coney Island Sideshow School to learn how to create, how, what, what is it like to create your, your sideshow, active sideshow skills school. So this is, uh, <laughs> there we are, eating fire and escaping from straight jackets. And that's our teacher, Adam Reelman, who is a, uh, <laughs> he is a performer at Coney Island. He grew up in Coney Island. I loved it there, so tawdry. I couldn't do a lot of the things. I did, I did uh, walk on glass and put my face in glass and escape from the uh, uh, straight jacket. That was the only time I was brave enough to uh, eat fire. Uh, I really couldn't do the sword swallowing. That was tough. And the one thing important to, to note about Sideshow, the thing that, that's different about Sideshow in ter that from uh, theater or even magic is that in Sideshow acts, there's no trick. You are really doing it. So in order to do the sword swallowing, you actually have to displace your larynx, make it move forward in order to get the It was not <laughs> happening. <laughs> It was not happening. And Leanne stuck a, no, a nail up her nose. This is again from the 2013 workshop production. Um, in this one, uh, Leanne couldn't be there for this part of the performance. So PJ Prudat, who is a Métis actor, a wonderful Métis actor, took, a, took on the role of Panther Girl. And this is Izzy the Invisible Woman in Panther Girl the beginnings of them. And you can see I'm still, it's a workshop, I'm still on script. I'm going back on Tuesday into another, another layer into Izzy the Invisible Woman. I have yet to create her sideshow act. But we know where, I'm, where we're going. And this is a piece that I worked on. This is a, a yaki dancer named Norma Araisa. And I asked her to create with me a snake charmer, because there are, there are a number of sort of stock sideshow characters uh, that we're trying to people our world with. I'm not sure, maybe, maybe this will be a projection. Maybe it will be like in a Nickelodeon audience. will have to come put a nickel in and look and see her, her dance as a uh, snake charmer. The other character, there are sort of bookend pieces, that uh, is a stock character of the sideshow is what was called in sideshow lingo the he, she. So tra transgender peoples would often uh, be on display. And, and uh, I would like to find a, a trans performer who will create that piece to bookend this one. This is last month in Florida. So a different kind of land, but still mounds were are so widespread. The ones that were more in the northern area of Florida felt to me very, very similar, looked, felt, were laid out similar to the ones in, uh, in the Skogini region, similar to the ones in, in Alabama and uh, uh, Mississippi. Uh, even Cahokia, the ones as we got farther south were felt more similar to the one that I showed you in Banwari Trace in Trinidad. More shell, some were shell middens, some were mixed shell, earth, and sand. And there, that's with Jorge, part of the embodied process. Um, 
the mountains sing, and you sing to them. So this is what we were doing there. This is one. It's right in the middle of St. Petersburg, right in the middle of the city, this mound. And oh yeah, a lot of them are. And we, it was not very well cared for. This particular one felt like some, something heavy happened here. And it was also covered in broken beer bottles and garbage. So we came out of there with arms full of garbage that we threw away. And large, large shells are still all over, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years old. And the thing in Florida is that a lot of the, the mound, the parts of the mound and other parts of the complex, this was in, in a public park, but then there was a fence and very much more of that complex is on somebody's private property. You know? that, was the, that was the case in many places that we visited in Florida. This one I like because it lists the reg regulations. And this was um, not usual. This, please enjoy the history and say, walk softly, only foot traffic, no sliding or jumping down mountainsides, no bicycles. Excavations or removal of any mound contacts are, are prohibited. That was a new kind of thing to see and glad to see it. This is another one, this is a temple mound and then another side of uh, St. Petersburg. I like this one also, glad to see. This is a sacred pre-Columbian ceremonial mound complex. So in some places, when they are protected, they're protected well. Crystal River was one of the ones that reminded me of uh, the ones that we saw in, in the Hopewell area and the ones that we saw in Alabama and Mississippi, and they're not that far away. This is Crystal River. It's really high, the main temple mound there. This is Madeira Bickel Mound. This one gave us movement. This one gave us a floor plan. This one, we started moving simultaneously and spontaneously in a similar spiral. And I think about it, I still feel my calves vibrating from that. <coughs> and again, we never go on those mounds without laying down our tobacco. We never go on those mounds without offering something. We never go on those mounds without lighting a smudge. And we never enter in or leave that, a period of that work without feasting the ancestors who guided us and showed us where we needed to go and what we needed to know. That is a very important part of this process and, and methodology so that it's not, it's not what is performed in a theater. And this work will probably not be in a theater. We are looking at this work to be site specific, not on a mound, but at a mound site. We would like to, we're thinking, we'd like to do it at, uh, in, in Alabama, uh, there at Tuscaloosa. But also we found that the Crystal River site was another possibility, but we'd like to move it around, which means that because the mounds are different and have different vibrations and have different personalities, that the, the work itself will change from site to site. We're not going to go in and do the same scripted piece every time. That's Safety Harbor, and closer to the ocean. Two-thirds of that mound was wiped away by uh, Hurricane and it's huge, but it went way far out. This is a huge one. This is what we came away with. This is the mound, this the layout of mound sites and how that is starting to inform the 
the score, the embodied score, the movement score for how, for one piece, which was, we're about ready to show you, I think I'm gonna need some help, Josh. Um, so that when you see the outlines of how a mound complex is laid out, it looks a lot like this. So we're starting to layer that, and we're starting to be able to use, it's not developed yet, but instead of calling the parts of the story scenes, Jorge started to call them mound portals. So I go from mound portal one to mound portal two, from mound portal two, I go around and mound portal three, come out in mound portal four, and uh, oh, he's over there. I'll play a little bit of these um, 10 minutes that we came uh, up with from studio work that I did with him. This is the first time I ever worked with him as a director. He did something really, really interesting. He's a dancer and an actor, director, but primarily grounded in, a, as a body person, as a movement person. He didn't let me warm up. He didn't let me look at my text. But he said, no, what you remember, what's in your body is what's most true. It is what you need, is what you mo that is the most essential. So it was a really, it, it un, um, I, I, I could not be grounded and settled in how I do my work. I was just there, I don't know, do I remember that? What is it? What is this? What I, what, and um, that's what I, I can show you 10 minutes of. There's a little, there's a little spot there where my, my trusty sidekick went and put his thumb over the microphone on the iPad so the sound cuts out. I will tell you what I'm saying. We were going to edit that out, and then Josh said, ah, leave it in. The movement's interesting. <laughs> so this is really, really raw. This is studio work. This is a sketch. This is a sketch that correlates to that last sketch that I showed you. Right? So it's not performance. It's, uh, it's exploration. It's exploration gathering in the, the work of being on the land and taking that into my body and releasing it in studio. Are you with me? Yes. Okay. This, uh, this goes from the beginning, which is Endless Woman, into Izzy, the Invisible Woman, and we'll talk a little bit more about Izzy's you gotta history. You got down deep. God's will, the church women said. God's will, if and she lives or dies. Three days since her time set on her and with seeping, bleeding. Twin breach. Breach. Not leave her. I'll not leave this place. I'll not leave my grandmother's land. My great grandmother's land. I'll not leave this place. <coughs> Mist on the marshes in the morning. Sun on the river. Great blue. 
I need myself. Ham churn butter. Ham churn! With choke cherry jam. So that's Izzy telling a little bit of her story, of her history. And uh, Hiawatha Asylum for Insane Indians was a real place in Canton, South Dakota. It was a historical place. And many of the people, many of our people who ended up there, ended up there because, not because they had anything wrong with them, but because they refused to conform, because they fought the Indian agent, because they wouldn't give up the ceremonies. And that was the case with, with Izzy. And uh, she turns invisible and she leaves. And she ends up in the, in the sideshow. And that's what I'm going back to create starting on Tuesday, mm -hmm. is how this movement vocabulary and part of her story, how does serving high tea in the nut house, because she's already performing, they, they used to clean up patients to show, uh, put them in a parlor so for them to perform for, for people. That's how they raised money. So how does she then create her side, so, side show act out of that? That's what I'm going back to. So, I don't know if I'm over time, but. So if there are any questions, I'm sure it's all clear as mud. <laughs> She's from Virginia. Okay, that makes sense. She's Rappahannock from Virginia. She's loosely based on my great grandmother, who was from the backwoods of Westmoreland County, on the banks of the Rappahannock River, and come, Frank came from a long line of midwives. So that is what Izzy wouldn't give up. You know, was her her healing. Curious, because uh, you mentioned one of the slides, uh, you showed uh, a picture that was uh, an inspiration or thought of, of where you might be thinking in terms of sect design, of having one side be a, a mound and then the other side actually reveal a sideshow. And that got me thinking, I guess I'm just curious to, to hear you speak more about the correlation of uh, Mounds to the sideshow mm -hmm. story, uh, the, and then specific these two, two characters. Because uh, what I picked up on the correlation was the invisibility factor, mm -hmm. um, and, and I'm just curious: is, is it mostly that? Is there something else more to it than that? Or part of it's an invisibility factor. Part of it is the way in which our sacred sites have been perverted. And how do you undo that? And if you can undo that, you can put yourself back together. So a lot of this, a lot of this exploration has been about me finding fragments of self and making a whole body out of it. Um, 
example, more something that I was in order to to bring somebody new into this work. We've been working on this since 2011. So bringing someone in new now, last month, was, mm. but putting them on the land, did that work for us? Um, Jorge is Taino, originally from Cuba. His narrative is the Cuban exile narrative. But as we found out, <laughs> it's Cuban. Okay. <laughs> but pre-contact, there was lots of going back and forth, lots of going back and forth. The people from uh, from Florida, people from that whole area. If you look at the the Gulf, from from the Mississippi River, where what is now uh, Louisiana, Mississippi, going down to Texas, uh, Yucatan, how the Yucatan juts out there, and hits almost the tail of Cuba, and then you got Florida. I mean, as you know. You wait for a certain time when the tide changes, you can put a door in the water, Jorge said, and arrive in Florida. There was all of that going back and forth there. Then, with contact, I mean, the last people that settled in, in South Florida, what is Miami, came from Colombia and Venezuela, right? Yeah. So Cuba begins to look like the gateway to these other, these other lands, but we knew each other, right? And after contact, there were people that were abducted and taken to Cuba from the Choctaw, from the Chirimacha. Then there are people who were <coughs> running from the, the British armed the Yamasi to get them to go slaving for them among other nations. So what became the Seminole were groups from the Creek Nation who were escaping that ended up they, and the Calusa and the Tocobaga, who were peoples in Florida, escaped to Cuba, which means they already knew it was there, right? So one of the things that I said to, to Jorge as we were doing this work, well, what if you're not a Cuban exile? What if you've come home? And that tips the whole, that tips the whole story. So how do we rewrite those narratives? And the act of doing the work undoes that, that weave in a way that brings the knowledge that has always been here telling us who we are and what our purpose is as an antidote to what we are allowed to be in this world, which is the freaks, there for the titillation. Does that, does that answer your question? And I think that it's, because the show isn't completely built yet, I don't know what might come. You know? But that it's a felt sense that the healing is in the land, that the information is in the land. The ancestors left those for us to see, for us to experience, when all is almost gone. It's almost gone. We don't, we, we, oh. But if we can open those doors and windows, which we do in dream time, which we do in ceremony, nothing's lost. Okay. Kind of a roundabout question. No, 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 but like, I just was curious. Okay, you. it's coming. There was somebody else who was I don't know if I was thinking. How do you make work that honors a, a group of people that were real in history while not shying away from interpretation? How do you honor, how do you make creative work that, that is commemorative and respectful towards something that really has been there while also recognizing that you have to have a voice now, you have to have an interpretation? How do, you, how do you yourself like, process that and navigate that? One of the things I did some time ago was to stop being afraid of what I don't know. There are really good reasons why I don't know. But as long as there's somebody who knows, then my responsibility is to seek them out and find out and learn it. I don't ask myself about interpretation because this work is so deep that it goes to a place in the body, 
in the DNA, in the cellular memory, in the space between the cells. I've had enough experiences with finding information through this work that I have to, I have to trust it, that the stories that come out, I don't feel that I am interpreting from another place. I'm connecting to knowledge that is in me. I might feel it was interpretation if I were to try to do this in Denmark, you know, because I don't have that. I don't have that grounding. Those those aren't those aren't my people's bones in those in those moments. Mm -hmm. I think what's in the body is what's true. And that's why this work that I do privileges the body. It doesn't privilege text. It starts with the body, impulse, gesture, sound, movement, word, comes last. You know, that's kind of the opposite of European theocentric theater. It is the opposite. Yeah? Not kind of the opposite, it's the opposite. Okay. Somebody else had their hand up. Oh, no, it was. was it you? Um, yeah, actually, I'm not sure how to phrase this, because I feel like you may be answered it in a roundabout way, but like, I'm just curious to, there must be a lot of emotion in seeing these, when you were going to these sites. Emotion? Yeah. Emotion, yeah, yeah, like just like, in, you, whether it was difficult to find them or people had desecrated them or that, you know, um, I was thinking particularly with the plexi, when you had laid down and the elder had mentioned they had plexiglass there. So um, how does that inform your work? I mean, because I feel like particularly with um, the subject, there's just a lot of injustice in the history. Um, and so I was, I was curious to just like, because I feel like it must be kind of frustrating sometimes or, um, tragic. It, uh, tra uh, I'm trying to. I'm trying to choose my words. Uh, there's a sense of tragedy in, in what you're investigating, and um, I was just curious of like how you overcome that or how you work through that. Or we live with the injustice on a daily basis, whether on a mountain site or not. For me connecting to these places is the antidote to that. You know, that I'm really aware of the words dismember and remember and what remember means. Those places as portal to memory, to ancestral memory, those, those places as portals to the mother knowledge. Yes, there's sometimes sadness or outrage to see broken beer bottles on a sacred site, but the fact that they're there for us to see is nurturing and regenerative. And I do not associate the word tragedy with visiting those places. They're the antidote to the tragedy of I me. Mean, I, I live in a place where there are 2,000 missing and murdered indigenous women over the past 30 years. I live in a place where there are native communities where there are 140 suicide attempts over the past two weeks. That's tragedy. This work is, we're worth something. We knew something. We weren't always in a place that this was a deliberate, systemic plan to render us gone. What's still there is what sustains me and tells me there was a purpose that was sophisticated and complex and enormously powerful. And I'm connected to that. <laughs> um, I would love to ask you to, to join me 